AMD just announced its 7700 XT and 7800 XT RX series GPUs. These are coming out on September 6th. They'll be priced at $450 for the 7700 XT and $500 for the 7800 XT. So a $50 price gap is pretty small once you're up at, at this range anyway. Obviously, 100 to 150 is big, but 450 to 500, it'll be really interesting to see how these shape up because historically what often happens here is one of those two cards becomes the clear choice for value and the other one, eh, maybe it changes with time as prices move, but we may walk away here with one key card to point to. The cards are the first major entries from AMD into the mid-range for this generation. So up until now, basically the entire mid-range has been dominated by AMD 6800 XT or 6800 cards that it launched last generation. And those have stuck around as pretty good value. NVIDIA has been here with the 4060 Ti, like the 16 gigabyte model, but that's $500 for the same card as the 4060 Ti, just with a little bit more memory. And uh, it's not like that is not particularly competitive, the 4060 Ti 16 gigabyte. So AMD may have an easier entry here, especially at the $450 mark. AMD's big focus for these cards has been 1440p gaming, but it also announced FSR 3. And likewise, NVIDIA announced DLSS 3.5 this week. So, and we'll have a separate piece on that, by the way, talking more detail about DLSS. Uh, but for now, let's start with the hardware. Before that, this video is brought to you by Fantex and the G300A Mesh Edition case. The Fantex G300A revives the A-series approach to airflow that Fantex began really pushing with the P400A that we liked previously. The new G300A comes in a few variants based on fan count and uses the Fantex ultra-fine front mesh that allows for a higher airflow without double stacking filters, as we've shown in the past. The G300A Eclipse is a compact tower supporting ATX boards, and you can learn more at the link in the description below. Couple notes here. So AMD provided us watermarked slides a couple days before the announcement. And then much closer to when the announcement's going live, they sent us the unwatermarked slides, which for some reason have changed. So we're gonna show you two quick sets of slides where they originally had Hitman 3 in one of them, and then they removed it in the other. And it's so close to the news going up that we have no idea why. But the reason we're mentioning it is because there's two sets of data that AMD has provided and we're not sure what all they've changed or why they've done it. We just know that they changed it without any explanation. So anyway, now you know why, if there's any discrepancies uh, between outlets that are using the watermarked versus the unwatermarked slides. So as we get into the specs for these cards, it'll help to have a quick refresh of what the market looks like right now. We're gonna just grab a couple of sort of semi-random US retail sites and look at some of the pricing in situ uh, and ignore the original MSRPs of those cards. That'll help us get framing for where these are truly positioned. As a reminder, we're at 450 and 500 for the new AMD cards. Quickly checking Newegg, we noticed the 4060 Ti 8 gigabyte model tends to be around 390 to $400 still. It's not much of a surprise. It's still one of the newest cards. Last gen matters more though. The 6800 XT on Newegg is about 500 to $530 right now. Uh, like with some promo codes, and it'll be one of the key alternatives to the new $500 7800 XT. We also checked Amazon and saw prices around $500 to $550. Last gen Nvidia has RTX 3070s mostly stagnated now in the $380 to $400 range. And if you're okay with used cards, a quick check of eBay shows the 3080 is selling for between $400 and $550 on average. This obviously isn't a comprehensive check of the used market, but more of a gut check. And that covers most of the $400 to $500 last gen options and will be what we mostly compare the 7800 XT against going into our review, obviously other than the other newer price competitors like the 40 series. And now it's time to look at the specs. So getting into the specs, AMD provided this spec sheet. The 7700 XT has 54 CUs to the 7800 XT's 60 CUs or compute units. The gap between these is relatively small. We might end up again in a situation where based on the pricing at any given time, it may make the most sense to just buy one of them, but we'll find out in the reviews soon enough and we'll be working on one. For the CU count, it's not easy to make like for like comparisons to prior generations since the rest of the specs may have also changed. So instead, we'll start by jumping over to the same generation, 7900 XT for framing. The 79 XT has 84 CUs. The 7900 XTX has 96 CUs 
And then the new 7800 XT would therefore be at about 63% of the compute units of the 7900 XTX. But actual performance doesn't scale that way. It does help, though, to illustrate the range. For the 7600, that card has 32 CUs and establishes our current floor. Back to the 7700 XT and 7800 XT specs, the clocks are advertised as 2171 MHz to 2544 on the 77 XT and 2124 to 2430 on the 78 XT. It's not uncommon for the clocks to fall as the CU count or the die size typically increases as well, but it depends on the card. Memory capacity is 12 gigabytes on the $450 7700 XT and 16 gigabytes on the 7800 XT with the memory interface at 192 bits and 256 bits. AMD is also using faster memory on the 7800 XT at 19.5 gigabits per second to 18 gigabits per second. As for cache, AMD is running 48 megabytes on the 7700 XT and 64 megabytes on the 7800 XT. The 7900 XTX establishes the current ceiling at 96 megabytes of infinity cache. AMD also noted that its board power will be 245 watts on the 7700 XT and 263 watts on the 7800 XT, and total board power tends to be pretty close to the actual measured board power in stress test scenarios. Uh, of course, we'll still check for it, but that looks like it'll be our, our positioning on the power consumption. Now, the actual uh, cable choices will depend on vendor, but for both the cards we have here, we have uh, this 7700 XT from XFX. It's got two 8 pins on it. And then for the reference, 7800 XT we have from AMD, which is just a little bit thicker than two slots. This also has two 8 pins on it. Uh, now, again, that can change depending on which board partner model you look at. So uh, it depends on if they're shooting for some kind of Super OC SKU or something else. As for other details, AMD noted that these remain chiplet designs, as shown in the render behind the card on the specs page. There's a central GCD, and flanking it are MCDs, and AMD is using a mix of 5 nanometer and 6 nanometer processes for these different dies. If you haven't followed AMD's 7900 launches, then this chiplet approach, just so you know, was its first major attempt at executing a sort of Ryzen-style design on a consumer gaming GPU. It's been done on GPUs before, and multi-chip modules have long been written about by both NVIDIA and AMD, but the 7000 series tried to bring it to consumer gaming in the modern era, and our previous teardown of the 7900 XTX and XT shows that multi-chip approach and explains more of the packaging details if you want to learn more about the sort of physical characteristics of it. Now we can get into some of AMD's first party claims. We don't typically spend much time here since the technical press will, as a whole, have reviews soon enough. So there'll be plenty of third-party data to check out. But it still helps to get some context where AMD thinks these cards will be positioned. And this is where the difference in the slides comes in. So originally they had Hitman, which means there were eight games with ray tracing uh, explicitly declared. And then they removed it. But we I, obviously we still have both. So we'll just kind of flash between them so you've got all of it. For the 7800 XT, AMD showed it against the 4070 in a native 1440p benchmark. AMD claims a range of 18% deficit to 23% advantage against the 4070. Its best cases include Cyberpunk, which is in our test suite, and Modern Warfare 2. Its worst cases presented include Doom Eternal and F1 2023, specifically with ray tracing on medium. It appears AMD used ray tracing in at least eight of these tests, at least as explicitly listed in the titles here. And of those, it was ahead in three and behind in the remainder. As for the 7700 XT, AMD is positioning this one against the 4060 Ti. Remember that both models of the 4060 Ti are the same, except for the memory capacity. AMD claims large leads in its test suite over the 4060 Ti 16GB model. If that's the case, this may be one of the stronger value cards launched in this price category for a little while now. We're looking forward, though, to obviously independently testing it and seeing how it does in our suite. And honestly, what we're most looking forward to is seeing how the prices shake up in the second-hand market, but also the last-generation new market, because that market has stuck around far longer than is typical for uh, a GPU cycle, where because of the oversupply at the end of 30 series and 6000 series, we end up with and have had tons of good options that compete with the modern cards, which is also why we've seen such a delayed and staggered sort of rollout of these uh, lower priced cards versus the high end. So anyway, that market may get shaken up here by the presence of these two, which would further benefit people who are okay buying either used or buying new old stock. And that we think would mostly affect the $300 to $400 range pricing, so a little bit below these, 
It's just going to be a question of how much more inventory of the last generation for both NVIDIA and AMD is really left to be sold. As for FSR 3, we don't have a ton of technical deep dive details today, but we've got some basics. And it is, of course, built on the existing Fidelity Super Resolution, Fidelity FX Super Resolution technology that we've detailed in the past when that launched. So FSR 3, AMD said it will be rolling out with Forspoken first, maybe unfortunately, uh, and then Immortals of Avium. For larger launches, uh, probably Starfield is on the list, although at the time we're writing this, that hasn't been formally announced. But AMD did point to Bethesda being on its partner developers list for upcoming FSR inclusion. As for what it is, AMD noted that FSR 3 will combine latency reduction technology, frame generation, and it will also add a new quality mode. FSR and DLSS have varying quality settings that relate to the target resolution versus sort of the sourced resolution. And for example, quality, performance, and ultra performance are some of those settings. AMD's new mode is called Native AA, which AMD says will allow use of FSR 3 without upscaling while still applying the FSR anti-aliasing and sharpening. It'll depend on the game probably, but this could theoretically result in better image than Temporal AA. That'll also depend, though, on your preferences visually. AMD also reminded everyone that FSR runs on everything, so we've actually used it on, say, Intel in the past, and I think we've used it on NVIDIA as well when DLSS or XESS aren't present. As for performance expectations, AMD gave some examples of performance. It showed the expected multiples of increase with frame generation. Forspoken was shown going from 36 FPS to 122 by using a mix of upscaling, so the left image is native 4K without any upscaling, and frame generation with FSR in performance mode. Now, these are sort of lower quality settings, performance mode that is, as opposed to say quality. So this type of FPS increase, you are going to be trading off a lot of that image quality for those extra frames. And uh, whether or not you like it, uh, if you've had any experience with DLSS, you may be able to judge how you feel about it. We'll still likely spend some time testing it in a separate piece, though, from our review and try to help explain if we think it's worth it and when you should or shouldn't use it. For games that we know will support FSR 3, AMD noted Avatar, Cyberpunk 2077, probably the most relevant there for our test suite, Space Marine 2, Frostpunk, and several other upcoming games that will include FSR 3. As for the rest of AMD's news, it talked a little bit about AI processing capabilities, which we'll leave for other outlets that are AI-focused to talk about for now. Uh, it also talked about HyperRx and Smart Access Memory, or SAM. Smart Access Memory is not new. Actually, HyperRx isn't either. Uh, but for SAM, they're mostly just reminding everyone of the uplift. For us, this reminder doesn't mean anything because just so you're all aware, we do not currently test anything without rebar in our GPU suite. So we made the switch a while ago to rebar only or SAM only. Uh, and that, that means that uh, we no longer produce numbers where it's on versus off, we only do on. We have some old data with on versus off, but these days everything pretty much supports rebar. And, uh, you look at Intel, for example, and it's effectively a requirement at this point. As for HyperRx, it was previously announced, so it's not news to exist, but it's meant to be a single toggle or submenu to enable a suite of AMD's software solutions all at once, like anti-lag and fluid motion frames, or at least that was their original vision. And that's because AMD has so many features in its software suite that uh, probably they're noticing people are getting confused by them and they're trying to give one toggle. AMD also spent some time reminding people of its noise suppression technology, uh, also not technically news, it's been discussed before, and um, our main focus here is GPU hardware and FSR 3 anyway. So we'll have tests for both these cards coming up when the review is post. The launch again is September 6th, and then pricing is $450 and $500. Uh, we'll be looking at both of them. But that's it. Thanks for watching as always. Subscribe for more, and we'll see you all next time.